You know, we all hear about $50 billion, but again, we have to look much more closely. A lot of that is simply the cost of old equipment, how much that equipment cost in the 1980s, and is not like new money that's being spent. And the actual figure is much less uh, than what people think. Why are the Russians doing this? Uh, perhaps to scare away uh, foreign volunteers, and, and I think perhaps even also to, to prevent witnesses. It's 7.20 at about 7 a.m. our time. The alarms sounded in Kharkiv. That's where Joseph Lindsley is. Let's go live to Ukraine right now and find out what the situation is there. Joe, what's happening? Bob, good afternoon to you. Uh, it is currently quiet at the moment. We're under alarm in Kharkiv region, in Poltava region, which is just uh, to the west of here, and then down in the region of uh, surrounding Dnipro City. And in Donetsk, and Donetsk is where you know the, the most intense fighting is happening. Uh, but now there's the additional threat of, well, according to some officials in Dnipro, there's a threat of ballistic missiles. Uh, but at the moment, we have no further information. You know, these past several days, or and I, I think really anytime you're here in Kharkiv, 30 miles from Russia, the alarms are like a roller coaster. You know, they they sound throughout the day and night. Uh, this morning, one the the alarm this morning finished at about 7:15 our time. Uh, so we had a, a quiet morning. But then, of course, you know, rem- remembering, recalling what happened on Sunday when those two missiles hit the city center uh, without any warning whatsoever. And so yeah, it's uh, the alarms are a new level of uh, concern that something might be happening. But uh, at the moment, it is quiet. I have asked uh, friends here to, to let me know if their dogs start barking, because I've heard that, as I mentioned yesterday, that, that do- sometimes people's dogs will bark before even the alarm sounds. Uh, and so maybe that's our old fashioned way of no- knowing what's going on. Uh, yesterday here, I met with some sol- some Ukrainian soldiers who were uh, taking a small break and we had an interesting conversation. They were maybe I think it was six of them. And they were saying before February 24th, they lived completely different lives. You know, none of them had ever planned to be a soldier. Uh, they were, some were white collar, some were blue collar, some had their own businesses. None of, none of these guys knew each other. Now they're great friends. Uh, and they all have young kids. And they said on February 24th, uh, they signed up to fight. You know, and now we're approaching uh, almost one year of that, one year of living uh, in this atmosphere of fear and terror. I also spoke uh, with that, that the American nurse uh, about whom I, I, told, I told you her story yesterday. Uh, it sounds like she is getting stronger and recovering. And she gave me an interesting theory, which I've heard from, from some other people, that uh, those uh, that it seems that perhaps the Russians are targeting uh, rescuers and medics and people that are going to scenes to help. We've seen stories like this in Kramatorsk, uh, in the city that's been heavily bombarded, and of course in Bakhmut, uh, which is a very dangerous situation every day. But it seems that you know the Russians will strike a place, they will wait until the rescuers show up, and then there t- tends to be uh, a, a follow-up attack. And you know wh- why are the Russians doing this? Uh, perhaps to scare away uh, foreign volunteers, and and I think perhaps even also to to prevent witnesses, you know, to, to discourage Westerners from coming to Ukraine. So there are fewer witnesses to the atrocities and with hopes that, uh, you know, perhaps there will be less vociferous cries uh, for, for, for support for Ukraine. And so uh, this is kind of happening uh, perhaps behind the scenes. And meanwhile, a sort of extraordinary video I saw from a few days ago of Boris Johnson, the former prime minister of the UK, walking the halls of, of congressional offices uh, going door to door like a salesman uh, begging for help for Ukraine. And he's spent a lot of time here. I think he really does realize uh, how urgent the situation is. Seems to be getting more urgent uh, by the day. Reports uh, today that Ukraine says Russia is stockpiling ammunition and troops. Uh, there's a feeling that there is at least going to be a big Eastern offensive. Is that what you're hearing, Joseph? Yeah, well, and it's, you know, right now there's a lot of people trying to figure out what might be happening and you hear different theories, you know, that there's still the idea that perhaps uh, the Russians could come down from from Belarus in the north and have both an eastern offensive and then something in the west, uh, perhaps to cut off Lviv, uh, you know, which is something that we heard about in the early weeks and months of the war, but they were never able to do because they were surprised by by the strength of the Ukrainians. But there is a concern that, you know, the Russians have had, had time to adapt and to plan something bigger. Uh, you know, of course, the Russians, you know, they want people to be afraid of this. Uh, but I think there's an atmosphere right now of, of wanting to be ready. Uh, it's, you know, there's a, a few days ago, I visited uh, a, a, well, what was a church in, in a little village outside of Kharkiv. And it, th- that village had, uh, right after the village had been liberated, the Ukrainians had stocked 
uh, Ukrainians and foreign volunteers had stocked this small church that was built just a few years ago uh, with all kinds of supplies ready to uh, be deployed to those in need. And as soon as the church was filled up with supplies, Russians attacked it uh, with a a midnight artillery attack. Um, So we do see this, you know, I I think they have information. They 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 they've had time to examine, you know, who was doing what and who was where. And, and perhaps they've had time to to resupply and restock. And so, yeah, there there is a there, 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 it's a it's a climate. I mean, as I was saying yesterday to you, Bob, I, I feel now uh, very akin to the way I felt just one year ago with the warnings leading up to February 24th. Uh, those that chatter about something wicked coming is getting louder, just as it was one year ago. And it's clear the Russians aren't uh, playing by any of the old rules of war, and that's very scary. I saw a report the other day. Kids being fitted for bulletproof vests, young children, and a, a lot of a lot of people talk about the spirit of the Ukrainian people, and, and you have brought that home so well in your reporting, Joseph. Uh, and you have to start wondering, uh, the spirit is is not to be underestimated for sure. And and these are people defending their homeland against the Russians, but. Then you're up against so much more, many more troops and more missiles. And and you worry about that spirit versus those huge Russian forces. How worried are you? Yeah, exactly. Bob, I mean, I so often I mean, when I hear the stories of those who have been killed and those who have been wounded, but especially those who have been killed, you know, some of the first people to sign up to fight were this young generation, of the, the peaceful revolutionaries of 2014, who stood in the square, you know, until the corrupt pro-Putin regime fled. Uh, and in these past, you know, nine years, really eight years up until uh, February 24th last year, these were the leaders of the, anti-corru- the anti-corruption fighters in Ukraine. You know, they didn't flee the country like some of the oligarchs. And those are the, the, the men and women who are giving their lives, the young people. Uh, and, and so th- th- that's really the... Yeah, it's it, 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 that's the heaviness of this is that you you real you know I don't want their stories to be lost and forgotten but Ukraine without these people will not be what it was these past eight years and then that's why you know, there's even more urgency to to stop this so you don't lose an entire generation you know the the best and most creative minds and we have you know while you know Russia there's this debate now about whether or not Russia can have athletes in the Olympics uh, which is sort of crazy to me that they could do that it reminds me of 1936 in Berlin uh, but the uh, you know Ukrainians like all of the the talent here and the hopes and the dreams all of that energy is being directed simply towards survival uh, and so it's it, yeah it, 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 that's the reason why uh, you know the, the voices who who can see what is happening here such as myself you know uh, try to share the story that there needs to be some some greater support uh, from the West. And and I think when we look at the numbers from Washington, you know, we all hear about $50 billion, but again, we have to look much more closely. A lot of that is simply the cost of old equipment, how much that equipment costs in the 1980s and is not like new money that's being spent. And the actual figure is much less uh, than what people think. Terrific stories from Ukraine are available on the UkrainianFreedomNews.com website, and there are some videos there and links that I'm sure many of our listeners will be interested in. So check that out, UkrainianFreedomNews.com. Joseph, we, as always, pray for peace, and we'll talk tomorrow. Thank you, Bob. Until tomorrow. Joseph Lindsley, world's most interesting man. This I find in my garden. It's peace from rocket. Help us to win in the city work.